Chapter 64 Stubb's Supper Stubb's well had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we eighteen men with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert, sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all, except at long intervals, good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For, upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it, in China, Four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour, but this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along as if laden with pig lid and bulk. Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way, till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving well for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night and then handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin, and did not come forward again until morning. Though, in overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction, or impatience, or despair, seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain, and though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand, monomaniac object. Very soon you would have thought from the sound on the Pequod's decks that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links, the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored. Tied by the head to the stern, and by the tail to the bows, the whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessels and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines while the other remains standing. A little item may as well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold which the ship has upon the whale when moored alongside is by the flukes or tail and as from its greater density that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins, its flexibility even in death causes it to sink low beneath the surface, so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat in order to put the chain round it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small, strong line is prepared with a wooden float at its outer end and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management, the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mass, so that now having girdled the whale, the chain is readily made to follow suit, and being slipped along the body, is at last locked fast round the smallest part of the tail, at the point of junction with its broad flukes or lobes. If Moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in that the staid Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak, a steak, ere I sleep. You, Dagu, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small... Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not, as a general thing, and according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before realizing the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm well designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on Wells' flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hole, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. 
Peering over the side, you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen black waters and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark they thus leave on the whale may best be likened to the hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. Though amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks, like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them. And though, while the valiant butchers over the deck table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasseled, the sharks also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat. And though, were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing, that is to say, a shocking sharkish business enough for all parties. And though sharks also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, systematically trotting alongside, to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere, or a dead slave to be decently buried, and though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places, and occasions when sharks do most socially congregate and most hilariously feast, yet is there no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers and in gayer or more jovial spirits than around a dead sperm whale moored by night to a whale ship at sea. If you have never seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil worship and the expediency of conciliating the devil. But, as yet, Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him, no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own epicurean lips. Cook, cook, where's that old fleece? He cried at length, widening his legs still further, as if to form a more secure base for his supper, and at the same time darting his fork into the dish, as if stabbing with his lance. Cook, you cook, sail this way, cook. The old black, not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock at a most unseasonable hour, came shambling along from his galley, for, like many old blacks, there was something the matter with his knee pans, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans. This old fleece, as they called him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongs, which, after a clumsy fashion, were made of straightened iron hoops. This old ebony floundered along, and in obedience to the word of command, came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stubb's sideboard, when, with both hands folded before him, and resting on his two-legged cane, he bowed his arched back still further over, at the same time sideways inclining his head, so as to bring his best ear into play. Cook, said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth, don't you think this steak is rather overdone? You've been beating this steak too much, Cook. It's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good, a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks now over the side. Don't you see they prefer it tough and rare? What a shindy they are kicking up. Cook, go and talk to them. Tell them they are welcome to help themselves civilly and in moderation, but they must keep quiet. Blast me if I can hear my own voice. Away, Cook, and deliver my message. Here. Take this lantern, snatching one from his sideboard. Now then, go and preach to him. Sullenly taking the offered lantern, Old Fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks, and then, with one hand dropping his light low over the sea, so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs, and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice began addressing the sharks, while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overheard all that was said. Fellow critters, I's ordered here to say dat you must stop dat damn noise dare. You hear? Stop dat damn smackin' of de lip. Massa Stubb say dat you can fill your damn bellies up to de hatchings, but by gore you must stop dat damn racket. Cook, here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder. Why, damn your eyes, you mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That's no way to convert sinners, Cook. Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, sullenly turning to go. No, cook, go on, go on. Well then, beloved fellow critters. 
Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax him to it. Try that. And Fleece continued. Do you as all sharks, and by nature wary wacious, yet I say to you, fellow critters, that dat waciousness, top dat damn slappin' up your tail. How you tink to hear, s'pose you keep up such a damn slappin' and bitin' dare. Cook, cried Stubb, collaring him. I won't have that swearing. Talk to him gentlemanly. Once more the sermon proceeded. Your waciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame ye so much for. That is nature, and can't be helped. But to govern that wicked nature, that is the pint. You were sharks, sartin. But if you govern the shark in you, why then you be angel. For all angel is noting more than the shark well governed. Now, look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil, a helping yourselves from that whale. Don't be tearing the blubber out your neighbor's mood, I say. Is not one shark dude right as toter to that whale? And by gore, not on you has the right to that whale. That whale belonged to someone else. I know some of you has berry brig moot, brigger than odors, but then the brig mouth sometimes has the small bellies, so that the brigness of the mood is not to swallow with but to bit off the blubber for the small fry of sharks that can't get into the scrooge to help themselves. Well done, old fleece, cried Stubb. That's Christianity. Go on. No use going on. The damn willins will keep a scourging and slapping each other, Massa Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use of preaching to such damn guttons as you call em, till their bellies is full and their bellies is bottomless. And when they do get em full, they won't hear you then. For then they sink in the sea, go fast asleep on the coral, and can't hear noting at all, no more, for ever and ever. Upon my soul, I am about of the same opinion, so give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cussed, fellow critters, kick up the damnedest row as ever you can, fill your damn bellies till they bust and then die. Now, Cook, said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan, stand just where you stood before, there, over against me, and pay particular attention. All dention, said Fleece, again stooping over upon his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, Cook? What dat do wid de teak? said the old black testily. Silence. How old are you, cook? About ninety, they say, he gloomily muttered. And you have lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, cook, and don't know yet how to cook a well steak, rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word, so that morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, cook? Hind the hatchway, in ferry boat, going over de Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat. That's queer, too. But I want to know what country you were born in, Cook. Didn't I say de Roanoke country? He cried sharply. No, you didn't, Cook. But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. You must go home and be born over again. You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet. Bless my soul if I cook noter one, he growled angrily, turning round to depart. Come back, Cook. Here, hand me those tongs. Now take that bit of steak there, and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs towards him. Take it, and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cooked teak I ever taste. Josie, berry Josie. Cook, said Stubb, squaring himself once more. Do you belong to the church? Passed one once in Cape Down said the old man sullenly. And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, where you doubtless overheard a holy parson addressing his hearers as his beloved fellow creatures, have you, Cook? And yet you come here and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, eh? said Stubb. Where do you expect to go to, Cook? Go to bed very soon, he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast, heave to. I mean when you die, Cook. It's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When dis old brack man dies, said the negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, 
he himself won't go nowhere, but some breast angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four as they fetched Elijah. And fetch him where? Up there, said Fleece, holding his tongs straight over his head and keeping it there very solemnly. So then, you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? But don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that tall, said Fleece, again in the sulks. You said up there, didn't you? And now look yourself and see where your tongues are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lover's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there, except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders. Do ye hear? Hold your hat in one hand, and clap t'other atop of your heart, when I'm giving my orders, Cook. What? That your heart there? That's your gizzard. Aloft, aloft, that's it. Now you have it. Hold it there now, and pay attention. All dention, said the old black with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head, as if to get both ears in front at one and the same time. Well then, Cook, you see this well stake of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another well stake from my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the stake in one hand, and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it. Do you hear? And now tomorrow, Cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins, have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, Cook. There, now ye may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the mid-watch. Do you hear? Away you sail then. Halloa, stop. Make a bow before you go. A vast heaving again. Well balls for breakfast. Don't forget. Wish, by gore. Well eat him. Stead of him eat well. I'm breast if he ain't more of shark than Massa shark hisself, muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Speed up your reading and enhance your memory with Moby Dick by your side. Choose the tactile joy of a physical book or the convenience of Kindle and discover a deeper way to dive into this classic. Pairing the audiobook with the text takes your understanding and retention to the next level. Ready to transform your literary experience? Check the link in the description and pick the perfect format for you. With Echo Tales audiobooks, Moby Dick awaits. Dive deeper. Read faster. Remember more. Get your book now.